Good morning, everybody here, uh, both here in person at the amazing Fred Jones uh, Museum of Art uh, here at the University of Oklahoma, and those of you on Zoom, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're recording this session, uh, so it will be available on the web after this for those who are not able to attend, and we'll uh, promote it and advertise it again after the fact so others can, can uh, get to hear the exciting things that are going on and what we have to say. Uh, you know, 2022 still happens, still going on, right? But it's been a difficult year. Like uh, uh, fiscal 22, you know, starting in July of last year, it was hard. It was hard. Uh, you know, all these new variants of the COVID uh, virus uh, affected a lot of us in many, many different ways, uh, personally and through our families. And, uh, you know, it continues. I was just uh, exchanging email this morning with the chairman of the faculty senate exec. Uh, he's home recovering from COVID that he caught while attending a scientific conference in Berlin. And he's doing fine and he's gonna be okay. But, uh, but you know, a lot of us have been affected in many, many different ways. And you know, throughout it all, uh, the university continues to persevere and to do amazing things. And that's really a testament to the strength and the commitment of the faculty, the staff, the students, everybody that works here at the university. I'm, I'm really proud to uh, be able to share with you today some news about, uh, and some information about what happened during fiscal year 22 in the space of research and creative activity, which as you know is so important to our uh, mission and our vision of the future of the university. So thank you all for your tremendous effort and commitment uh, to success of the University of Oklahoma. We're, we're in a really, really good place right now. As you know, the um, university's strategic plan has five pillars, but there's two of them that I want to focus on today. You're gonna see throughout the presentation, you're gonna see references to pillars, strategies, and tactics in Lee Dong all throughout, because everything that we do is predicated on the lead on university strategic plan that President Harris and his team and the faculty and the staff put together now almost two years ago. Okay. There are two pillars relevant here. One is pillar number one, become a top tier public research university. Right? Uh, those words, as I always say, are loaded. Right? Top tier means you know, up in the top 10% uh, of public universities. Research means true commitment to research and creative activity. What does that mean? That means we wanna be a university that transmits knowledge to our students, but also creates new knowledge. Creates new knowledge that advances society and transmits that new knowledge to our students across the campus. That's what that means. Um, and Pillar 5 is about enriching Oklahoma, the nation and the world through research and creative activity. How do we do how do we create new knowledge that impacts society? Now, this is sort of a handful, you know, it's kind of an eye chart, an infographic, you know, that we call it, right? But, but I wanna point you towards all the green in there. And, and again, that's a testament to the strength of resilience and the commitment of the faculty, the staff, and the students at the university. We had an amazing year in fiscal 22. We grew research, sponsor research activity and expenditures by 12.5% relative to fiscal 21 uh, to a record ever for the university of almost 213 million. Uh, we grew federal research, which is really important in our metrics, right? Because we want to compete nationally on the federal scale. We grew federal research expenditures to 144.5 million. It's almost a 10% increase relative to last year. And uh, if you look across the board in the federal spectrum, in the Department of Defense, in the Department of Energy, in the National Science Foundation, in the NIH, um, uh, we grew even within the state of Oklahoma, we grew our funding, our support, and our expenditures for research by huge pounds and leaps. Okay. This really is an amazing, an amazing statistic. I don't think there are very many places that can put up numbers like this. We also, you know, through our Office of Research Services that does such amazing work every day, 24 seven, up and running 24 uh, seven, serving the faculty at the university to go out and submit proposals to win new awards. We had over a thousand, well over a thousand proposals submitted last year with a 
you know, frankly, again, in a difficult time uh, when COVID was affecting a lot of people. And, um, you know, it, it, with, a, with an amazing team led by uh, uh, Michael Purcell and his team that is, is just did an amazing job. 812 million Toro submitted uh, uh, dollars to federal and, and other sponsors and uh, total awards of $231.5 million, which is up uh, uh, 30, over 30% 30 relative to last year. So again, uh, the trajectory is amazing. If you look actually at the, at the graphs, at the data this way, you see the trajectory at the university since 2018. Over the, the last few years, this is total sponsored research expenditures at OU Norman campus. Uh, that's federal. You know, those trajectories, uh, you know, frankly, are incredible. They're hard to sustain, uh, but we're doing everything that we can to sustain them. And I want to talk a little bit about, about that. In fact, if you look at it by college, and these are not all the colleges at the Norman campus, but the five that, has the lar that have the largest uh, uh, research expenditures, what you see is actually really interesting. There is an upward slope in FY22 across the board. So it's not just that we're growing in one area, one specific area, but like I said, we're getting more funding, more resources from multiple federal agencies and every college on campus, every faculty member at every college in every department and school is really pulling their weight and bringing and doing more creative activity, more discovery, more creation of new knowledge through research. Now, I told you at the beginning that one of the pillars talks about becoming a top tier public research university. How, how do you measure against that? We're very focused on understanding performance indicators and how do we measure our progress beyond these charts, right? So how do you compare to others? How do we do, right? The American Association of Universities uh, is the benchmark. Um, uh, there is 65 universities in the United States, about 34 of those, I think, roughly are public universities that belong to the AAU. You don't apply to the club, you get asked to join, and you have to meet a certain set, set of benchmarks to be on the scale of the top tier universities in the, in the nation. And these are benchmarks that are very much related to research. So we wanna look at how we're doing. Uh, the indicators, you're not going to be able to read this, but I'll just tell you that they have to do with federal funding. That's why I showed you that chart. They have to do with total research expenditures. They have to do with number of doctorates granted. They have to do with number of postdocs, citations to scientific papers, and they have to do with members in highly prestigious honorific societies like the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, or other such societies, members of the faculty who belong and are elected to those very prestigious societies. Okay. So we have a, a process of tracking data and comparing ourselves against the top 90 Carnegie R1 universities in the country. Okay. And those arrows indicate uh, where we are today. Uh, if you look at our most recent data, we're moving up with respect to that top 90 in federal research funding. We're moving up in the state, local, industrial research funding, and we're moving up in the number of postdocs relative to the, to the total size of the faculty at the university. Those are all really good indicators, but we have some areas in which we're not, and we, need, we have some work that we need to do. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here is a, a comparison uh, of federal research expenditures, phase one, number one criterion for AAU, federal research expenditures per faculty member, Okay. at different universities, some of them members of the AAU, some of them competitors who want to be in the AAU. Okay. And this is just a sampling, but here we are. We're kind of in the middle of the pack. We have universities around us like Arizona State or, or North Carolina State that are not members of the AAU, but aspire to be like we do. So think of that as the direct competition. And these numbers are normalized by total size of the faculty, by the way. Okay. So apples to apples. We have universities like Purdue, where I came from, that actually do less federal funding per faculty member than we do, and they're in the AAU. And there's others like the University of Utah that just became a member. So you see, you see the scale. It's, you know, I think with the progress we're making and the trajectory that we have, we're actually looking uh, very competitive uh, with respect. And I'm really proud of that, by the way. And the, and the diversification of federal funding across the university uh, with the Department of Defense and NIH, and you'll see some of those numbers, it is really promising. 
Now, here is one statistic where we don't do that well, and is how many faculty members, tenure, tenure track faculty members, does it take to have a member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine? That's the highest prestige academies in the nation, okay? Created by President Lincoln, okay, back in the 1800s, uh, to bring the most prestigious academics into these societies to advise the government on critical science, technology, and society issues. Uh, Arizona State, for every 83 members of the faculty, there is a National Academy member. Just to uh, um, North Carolina State, for every 62 members of the faculty, there is a National Academy member. It takes 900 members of the faculty to find one at the University of Oklahoma. So we have work to do. This is not a reflection of the quality of our faculty. Okay? This is a reflection of the fact that perhaps in the past there was not a lot of attention that given to nominating faculty to these academies, to doing the work necessary to promote our faculty, our outstanding faculty, so that the external community looks at us and says, yeah, you know, so-and-so needs to be, should be one of my peers in the National Academy of Sciences, and so on. So we have work to do with this. We do a really good job at the University of Oklahoma, in my opinion, of nominating and promoting people internally to awards, to presidential professorships, to George Lynn Cross professorships, and that's all terrific. That's all phenomenal. We have to continue doing that, but we have to get better at the external game. Okay. So the uh, um, chairman of the faculty senate, uh, Dave Hambright, uh, the provost, Andre Wright, and myself just launched a new committee. Uh, we call it the Faculty Honorifics Committee. Uh, we call for that in the strategic plan, by the way. Uh, uh, so this is in response to one of those tactics in there. Uh, the Faculty Honorifics Committee will be chaired by uh, Georgia Cosmopoulou. Thank you, Georgia, for taking on that, that uh, big responsibility. It will have nine members that were uh, nominated by the Faculty Senate, the Provost and myself, and uh, they have a very clear charter. The charter is to, first of all, find low-hanging fruit at the university, right? Find those faculty that we know should be members of the National Academies, should be members of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, should be Guggenheim Fellows, should be MacArthur Fellows, should be whatever these high-level honorifics are that the National Research Council uh, uh, defines. People that should be seen by the external community and part of this uh, uh, community outside, find those faculty and help us get them nominated to these uh, academies. Uh, so they're going to be working across the campus. They're going to be working with deans and department heads and the faculty. Um, they will have access to the academic analytics database. Uh, we're working closely with academic analytics to ensure the integrity of the data. And they will have access to everybody and everything to, uh, uh, to help start putting nominations together for some of our, uh, um, you know, academically from a research and creative activity perspective, uh, highest, highest recognized faculty externally and nominating them to this society. So I'm very excited about this because we have to bring our own into this. And as we hire faculty for the future, you know, we have to think about the kinds of junior faculty that we hire that aspire to be members of the National Academy, that aspire to be members of this and that honorific society in the future, and how do we bring them up? How do we nominate them to early career awards, to early junior fellowships that then lead to having the resume that recognizes the scientific, the research, the creative activity accomplishments, and makes them uh, uh, future members of these kinds of societies. So this is something that I think was much needed. I think, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the work of the committee. I'm going to stay very closely connected with them, and I'm sure that we're going to make great progress. Right, Georgia? I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, okay, so I wanted to make sure everybody knew about this, because a lot of you are going to be uh, helping the committee, for sure. Uh, but then I also want to talk a little bit about, as you know, our strategic research uh, portfolio and what we're doing uh, from my office. Uh, as you know, we uh, stood up... Um, series of strategic research verticals in response to uh, Pillar 5 of the strategic plan. Um, 
and also a series of cross-cutting foundational centers and institutes that support and enable the strategic research verticals. You've heard me talk about this many times. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit at the about the progress in the verticals. Uh, you always have access to the directors and uh, the networking events that get organized. I'm not going to talk about the foundations because I was will be here all morning. Uh, but that's all going to be available to you, what I was going to say on the, on the web version of the presentation. And of course, always the directors are always ready to talk with everybody. Um, you know, in about, what is it, Gene, now a year ago, almost a year ago, nine months ago, we hired uh, Lieutenant General Gene Kirkland. Uh, the day after he retired, pretty much, he became an OU employee. And uh, we're incredibly proud, and, and, and I couldn't tell you just the impact that General Kirkland uh, has had on our efforts in aerospace and defense over this last year. Uh, we're on an exponential trajectory right now. Uh, the Institute, the Oklahoma Aerospace and Defense Innovation Institute, uh, has created an ecosystem of support, of partnerships, of relationships that are just absolutely, uh, um, um, you know, tailored and targeted towards the needs of uh, our military uh, in Oklahoma and across the country, serving uh, the nation with our research and creative activity in two, particularly in two specific areas. One around sustainment, Air Force sustainment with Tinker Air Force Base, and the other one in bringing our advanced digital phase array radar capability that we have developed over the years at the radar center uh, for the weather mission, bringing those capabilities, that know-how, that expertise into other uh, um, uh, national security uh, challenges and imperatives uh, with the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army. So uh, tremendous success just across the board in bringing resources to the university, in, in hiring new faculty with colleges across campus, and in essentially in bringing people together around this critical vertical and, and, and critical issue of national security and defense and how do universities, how do academic institutions bring their creativity, their research capability and strength, their know-how to help uh, our war fighters succeed and continue protecting our freedoms and liberties. Okay? Very, very important. I'm very proud of what's going on in that institute and I think the future is just going to be uh, exponentially uh, more and more amazing. So. Uh, Another vertical, of course, is the Institute for uh, Resilient Energy and Environmental Systems uh, that is led by Professor Tim Philly. Uh, you know, Tim again joined us uh, about a year ago, maybe not even, uh, and he's already, is like a whirlwind, you know, he's already having a tremendous impact across the campus. He's bringing a great team together around the Institute. He's reaching across the entire uh, university and really is starting to push in multiple directions that have to do with Again, bringing university capability to the energy transition of the future. Thinking about decarbonization by 2050, thinking about you know, what's the blend of energy systems from fossil fuels to advanced uh, future energy systems like hydrogen and, and working with the Department of Energy, with the USDA, with uh, um, the Department of Transportation, with Latin America and USAID to create new programs of research um, um, that, that bring our expertise to bear on this really critical topic of energy and climate as we think about the future. So this is integrating uh, um, uh, colleges across campus. I mean, the College of Atmospheric and Geographical Sciences and the Institute are working very closely on an urban integrated field laboratory. It's a $20 million proposal to the Department of Energy. Um, there are proposals, um, you know, in the hydrogen space that has just been won in the team of uh, Professor Papa Vasilius and, and Professor Crossley in chemical engineering. There are uh, future proposals in the area of hydrogen. We're part of a big effort uh, between Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana to go after a Department of Energy $1 billion hydrogen hub. Uh, if we're successful and we win that uh, bid when the government puts out the RFP, uh, the university is going to have a central role in pushing forward the hydrogen economy in the state of Oklahoma. So I'm very proud of what's going on here. Um, and, and again, just getting started, but tremendous progress. Uh, we haven't yet stood up the Integrated Life Sciences Institute. Uh, Professor West and West uh, has been working 
uh, on this. And uh, this year, uh, hopefully, we're going to post the position of director uh, nationally. We're going to do a national search for a director of this institute. This institute is intended to bring together the life sciences and fundamental biology, biochemistry, chemistry expertise at the University of Oklahoma in Norman with our Health Sciences Center and bringing together our basic research scientists with the clinical translation research that happens at HSC in areas like cancer, like diabetes, like gerontology, and, and bringing that know-how together. Even though we still don't have a director, there's been tremendous progress. I mean, there's tremendous growth in uh, working with NIH at the university. We have several new NIH awards, totaling almost $30 million um, across the campus in biomedical engineering, in biochemistry, um, in structural biology, and some new, interestingly, uh, NSF awards in pandemic prevention. Uh, we're the only university in the country that won $2 million NSF Pandemic Prevention Center planning grants uh, in these last couple of weeks. Professor Ebert, uh, who heads the Data Science Institute for Societal Challenges, Wang Wang with his team, which includes Health Sciences Center, and Professor Xiaoming Xiao in uh, um, Environmental Microbiology won the other one. Um, those are planning grants for much bigger efforts, and so lots of excitement uh, at the university across the campuses, but also in the state uh, to bring one of these, eventually one of these national pandemic uh, preparedness centers uh, and prevention uh, centers here to Oklahoma. Uh, Professor Shane Connolly leads the Institute for Community and Society Transformation. And in the, in the, in the months that she has been in, in charge, she's just completely taken this into a into a, into a whole different place. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of faculty that are convening around the ICAST Institute um, with great new efforts across campus in uh, areas like safe and trustworthy computing, uh, ethics uh, of indigenous genomic research. Uh, there are a lot of issues at the intersection of technology and society that have to do with ethical uses of technology. Uh, we're talking a lot about AI trusted artificial intelligence and the ethical uses of AI and autonomous systems in war fighting. Uh, we're submitting proposals uh, for children and families on evaluating Head Start childhood education programs. Our early childhood education programs are blossoming and are an integral part of ICAST. And ICAST is also, like many other of our centers and institutes, uh, awarding seed grants to faculty to generate interest and uh, provide uh, you know, resources to help drive future research and future research proposals um, in, in this space of community and society and technology. Now, um, at the same time, as you know, as I said, I'm not going to talk about the horizontal institutes, the data science and quantum, uh, public policy research and analysis and, and uh, radar today, uh, but we will do that at the next uh, meeting. We'll focus on those at the next uh, town hall. But uh, what I want to also do is tell you a little bit about the seed funding in addition to these institutes that we're providing across the university, because I think that's also important. We're trying through my office, we're trying to use the precious resources that we have to incentivize key areas of research and creative activity through competitive processes that are peer reviewed so the faculty have access to seed grants, to seed resources, to explore new ideas and create new areas of research and opportunity for us. This is also aligned with the strategic plan, of course, it's called for there. And we have, over the last couple of years, uh, Ann West has been leading the charge here, uh, together with John Antonio and Janet Ward. And we have been investing about 1.7 million, uh, fiscal 20 through the present, okay? in seed grants in these areas. We have invested in COVID-19 related research. We have invested in inequities in the academic research enterprise, really important. You know, two years ago, when we found ourselves in the midst of major national disruptions having to do with, um, um, you know, racism and inequities, uh, the university responded by looking at how do those issues impact academic enterprise. And we funded a group of faculty across campus that have uh, done amazing work uh, looking at the question of inequities across the academic uh, research enterprise. 
and actually recently succeeded in winning an NSF advance grant that is truly going to transform the way that we do promotion and tenure and other things uh, on campus and in, in American universities by taking into account equity and inclusion uh, um, issues in, in these critical academic uh, enterprise uh, topics. So we also supported the Big Idea Challenge. Uh, uh, there were four or five projects funded at significant levels of support. Uh, those are having also tremendous impact. Uh, as you can see there, the ROI on this $1.7 million worth of investments is about a uh, factor of 14 almost to date. So in just two years that these projects have been going on, uh, $23 million in new grants that are directly connected to the seeding of this project, right, have already come back to the university. So I'll take that investment any time. If anybody can tell me, I'll give you 14 time ROI in two years, let me know. Okay, I got, I got a couple of dollars here in my pocket that I'll put in your investment fund. Um, you know, Social Sciences, Humanities, and our seed grant program uh, started in the summer of 21. Uh, we have a matching program for postdoctoral researchers that I think is having a good impact. We want to keep growing the number of postdocs at the university. They're key to running research groups and, and to driving the research enterprise. In, in the academy, and uh, we have another grant um, that provides, uh, helps faculty uh, ask for and get um, uh, course buyouts to write large, significant uh, external grant proposals. So we're incentivizing that sort of thing. Overall, we're gonna continue doing this, uh, these programs, and we're gonna launch some new ones. The Research Council, as you know, also supports a lot of seed grants across the campus. Uh, the Research Council is appointed by the Faculty Senate, by the Provost and by myself. And uh, over the last few years, uh, they have uh, 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 awarded grants. In, this is for fiscals 19 and 20. Again, tremendous return on investment, a factor of 21 relative to the amount of money awarded. Uh, great outcomes in terms of publications and uh, proposals. Uh, leading to $7.7 .7 million of uh, uh, grants, conference presentations, books, et cetera. You can see that there. So great impact of uh, the programs that the Research Council manages, both for senior faculty and for junior faculty. Importantly, one of these programs to the Research Council is focused on junior faculty, tenure track faculty, uh, to help them, um, um, you know, um, to incentivize and help them succeed in their research part of the job part of their mission as they seek, for te seek tenure at the university. Um, we also have developed, as we call for in the strategic plan, a very strong congressional and state affairs team at the university. Uh, President Harris has been very focused on this, as has uh, Vice President for Executive Affairs, uh, Sean Burridge. And um, a few months ago, uh, Holly Hunt uh, came on as Executive Director of Congressional and State Affairs for all three campuses of the university. Uh, we have been working very closely with her and her team. And you know, we've put together uh, a group of uh, uh, support uh, consultants and firms uh, in Washington, D.C. that help us with multiple federal agencies. We work very closely with Lewis Burke Associates, uh, which is a small boutique firm. Many of you have interacted with them. They specialize in helping academic institutions work through the federal system. Uh, not so much in lobbying Congress, but more in terms of understanding what's happening in the various agencies within the federal government. Uh, we work with them on NSF, DOE, EDA, and the Department of Commerce, NIH. They're incredibly helpful. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about Lewis Burke in a minute. Um, Clark Hill and Associates uh, are key to our efforts with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration and with NASA, uh, mainly in the College of Atmospheric and Geographical Sciences. Uh, Stepto and Cornerstone help us with DOD uh, through their consultants or the lobbying efforts. And so we've put together what I believe is a very strong partnership with our congressional delegation that has translated into very significant uh, congressional plus apps that are directed towards the university. And we've also built uh, through Holy Hand and Sean Burridge a very strong partnership with the state legislature and the governor's office. Um, for the first time in many, many, many years, last year, in, uh, at the end of fiscal 21, uh, the state legislature uh, approved uh, funding uh, for several uh, research facilities and, and, and issues and topics. 
here at the university. They gave us uh, an additional $5 million in the recovering budget in the general education budget to grow faculty in engineering, to help meet the workforce needs of the state. And they also provided us with money to build our new defense and national security facility here on campus. Uh, this year, similarly, uh, they supported a lot of the things that we asked for. And so we have a very strong relationship with the state legislature, which really bodes well for the present and future of the university. At the same time, uh, we also, in my office, work very closely with the provost office and the Center for Faculty Excellence, in particular with the research and creative activities team there at the CFE. Um, you know, the CFE is playing a tremendous role in convening faculty and helping faculty understand how to navigate the research enterprise. I, I cannot tell you enough about how strong uh, that team is. Uh, they are uh, having events uh, regularly with our institutes and centers. Um, they just had one with the Aerospace and Defense Institute uh, yesterday. Uh, they're having events in which they bring Lewisburg associates, they bring experts from Lewisburg to help faculty understand where the funding is going to be, where, where the federal agencies are going to, and holding town hall meetings and informational meetings for faculty. Uh, they're um, doing a lot of proposal development workshops and generally creating a lot of informational opportunities for faculty to learn about uh, research systems uh, compliance and federal uh, uh, research uh, uh, systems. So a key element of uh, support for research and creative activity here at the university. Uh, we've also this last year been busy growing the Office of Innovation and Corporate Partnerships. Uh, just a few months ago, about a year ago or so now, we hired uh, Mr. John Hanak uh, out of Purdue University. There's a recurring theme here, a lot of the names that you hear, but but uh, John came, was leading uh, Purdue Ventures, a very successful effort to uh, start up new companies based on Purdue intellectual property. And uh, he came and joined us here at the university to stand up this new office, which again was called for in the strategic plan and focuses on helping us grow corporate partnerships and innovation across the ecosystem, helping faculty from the university take their ideas, take their technology, uh, uh, disclose inventions, patent technologies, and either commercialize or start up new companies uh, that bring those technologies to the market. So very exciting uh, uh, what's going on there. Uh, we're already starting to see through these cohorts that are being created by the office, uh, growth in you know, more, more, more awareness on the part of the faculty, and we're trying to make it easier for faculty to commercialize technologies, to start up relationships with companies, to get through the negotiations of intellectual property and all those things. It's a work in progress. It's a tough, uh, uh, these are difficult issues uh, that take time, but I think uh, uh, the response that we're seeing and the number of partnerships that are growing and the amount of uh, funding that is coming to the university through corporate partners is starting to grow, and I'm excited about where this, uh, this office is going. Um, now, to do all of this, you know, we have, a, we have a great team in my office, but it also takes a lot of advice. It takes a lot of understanding of what the faculty, the staff, the students need, what is important, what isn't, and really how do you navigate some of the barriers and the impediments that sometimes keep us from being as productive as we think we should be, or as we think we can be. So just this last year, uh, we created uh, the Faculty Senate Research Advisory Committee. I don't know what happened to Emily's picture, but uh, uh, she was chairing it this last year. Uh, this is a brand new committee um, uh, that meets with me and my team on a monthly basis. Uh, their charter is to identify barriers to progress and success in the research and creative activity enterprise bringing up to my attention and my team's attention, and then work with us to propose solutions and processes and ways to get, take down those barriers and get through those uh, difficulties. Um, they are incredibly engaged. It's a great team of faculty. Uh, this team will be rotating. So the faculty senate, the provost and myself, again, working together, will be asking for nominations uh, for new members of this advisory committee is incredibly important. The chair of the research council uh, is joining the committee now representing the research council on that. 
um, uh, advisory committee, and I'm really excited about now that the semester, that the academic year is getting started, uh, to start it, starting to meet uh, with them, and, and again, working through some of those pesky barriers that we don't like uh, that get in the way of doing the things we want to do. Um, also, I wanted to highlight for you the members of the Research Council. Uh, Professor Wang is the chair this year of the council, but there's a great representation across the campus, and as I said, you know, they, they provide uh, excellent resources for faculty, and I want to encourage you all to work closely with the Research Council. They provide excellent resources to these uh, 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 seed programs and, and other expertise that they bring to the table for faculty to, to have access to what the university can do in terms of enhancing their research and creative activity. Um, and again, they do this across all disciplines, humanities, social, social sciences, arts, the STEM disciplines. Uh, they're really representative of the entire, of the entire campus. Um, and let me um, just close um, before I tell you about what to expect in 2013 by again highlighting the incredible success and accomplishments of our faculty. We felt that it was very important to create a program of research and creative activity awards. And to this year, for the first time, we had a banquet in person. We celebrated uh, uh, people um, in the strategic plan. We call for the creation of a new uh, research and creative activity awards and recognition program at the university level. And colleges do this all the time. Uh, but we thought that it was really important to have a, a, a program at the university level that recognized early career faculty, that recognized excellence in research, grantmanship, uh, excellence in research and engineering in applied sciences, excellence in the humanities and the social sciences, and design and creative expression, excellence in transdisciplinary convergent research and excellence in research service and administration, which is really important. At the end of the day, I cannot stress enough that none of what we do is possible without the amazing staff that we have here at the university supporting faculty and the students. Uh, so thank you to all the staff that are here today in person because the work that you do across all these areas really empowers us and really fuels the engine that is driving this exponential growth today. So thank you for that. Um, what to expect in 23? And then I'm going to open it up for questions from the Zoom audience and from the audience here. Okay. Um, what to expect in fiscal 23? Okay. We're going to do a lot more of the same. Okay. I mean, I think that's the bottom line. We're being pretty successful so, as a university. So let's keep going. Let's keep doing it. Okay. Let's keep committed to research and creative activity. You tell me what you need, and me and my team are going to you know, turn every stone uh, uh, in Norman and across Oklahoma and across the country to bring you what you need so that you can succeed. That's what we're going to do in fiscal 23. Now, you know, yes, we're going to stand up the Integrated Life Sciences Institute. We're going to do a national search, as I said before. I think it's a huge opportunity for us in Norman, partnering with the Health Sciences Center and Tulsa, right, um, uh, to really do something spectacular here in this space of human health and the future of health. Um, we're going to continue supporting center scale, nationally competitive proposals to federal agencies. I, I will tell you straight out, right, that, that you know, that's why we do some of the seed grants that we do. We're very focused on uh, using the resources that we have internally, not to just spend the money that we have, but to bring more money and new money to the university so that we can do more and more research and creative activity. And doing this, being nationally competitive, doing these large scale centers, and going after that sort of uh, uh, very difficult but very competitive uh, proposals is key to our success. And we're enabling that in many, many different ways. So we're going to stay very focused on that topic. Uh, we're going to continue seed funding initiatives internally to incentivize all of this across all those areas and some new ones to be announced uh, in the near future than Ang West and uh, John Antonio and the team uh, in my office are thinking about and working on with the institute directors. And then, uh, you know, we're going to have another round of the very successful research and creative activity awards. And I want to mention that at the very end and leave that with all of you because we're going to, together with the provost, as the provost announces all the excellence awards, you know, across the, the academic enterprise, 
We're going to announce the Research and Creative Activity Awards at the same time on September 15th. And your nominations, as, as we said before, you know, internally, uh, as, as we're talking about doing externally, your nominations of your peers, your colleagues in the faculty to this Research and Creative Activity Award are what fuel the program, are what, what drive the success of us recognizing the accomplishments of our friends and peers. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm please um, um, look at that when it comes out and help us uh, um, identify your peers and colleagues that uh, uh, we need to recognize this year for their accomplishments in this space. So with that, uh, thank you also very much uh, for your attention and uh, let's keep making uh, progress and changing lives uh, through research and creative activity. Thanks. I know this was also clear that there are probably no questions anywhere, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, Brian. <laughs>
bringing students here so they can see the university? Because when you bring them here, they all of a sudden go, oh, this is Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh, this is Norman, you know. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what field they're in, right? I think that getting them here is so important. And so I'm happy to help volunteer. Awesome. You're wrong. Help you out with that <laughs> committee. No, I mean, you're, you're so right. I mean, I think it's a lot of it is about getting people here. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the success of our research and creative activity enterprise right now and the kinds of new programs and projects and proposals that are going in, out and coming into the university, I mean, we're, we're on the forefront of many, many fields from the social sciences to the STEM disciplines and the humanities and so on. And, and we just got to do a better job of recruiting, but we also have to provide the resources to, to, to incentivize this. I think we also, I, I mean, look, I'll just follow up on what I was saying to Brian at the end. Um, I think we also have to create some new interdisciplinary PhD programs across the campus, okay? I think that's where we need to go. That's what I'm talking about, that's what I'm working on. I think there are some critical areas of uh, research today where students want to be, okay? It's the things that are driving society and students want to get their degrees there, not just bachelor's degrees, but advanced, and not, ma not just master's degrees, I'm talking about PhDs, training students to be the next generation leaders in critical areas of society, like energy and climate, like material science, like, uh, you know, the life sciences and biology and and uh, other areas in the social sciences and so on, right? And, and I think uh, those, and I've seen this at other universities, right? Those interdisciplinary graduate programs, which sit kind of not in a specific department of college, but that are interdisciplinary, right? In these key areas, uh, really are a big attractor to uh, PhD students and to faculty to be part of things like that. So hold that thought, right? Starting to think about that, starting to uh, 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 advocate for those kinds of issues, those kinds of programs. I think it's a, a way that we can grow our PhD graduation rate over the next few years. Okay. Yeah, and, and so, you know, and, and again, you know, I, I really applaud what is going on in the College of Arts and Sciences, in the Dutch uh, College. Uh, we have to do that across the university. Right? We have to do that in other uh, colleges and, and, and areas, and we have to be able to do that. So, so anyway, we're working on it. It's a work in progress, but uh, uh, a very, very strong focus for us in Fiscal 23. And is anything else you want to add? Or? No? Okay. Other questions? Any questions from outside the room? Okay. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Kim Marshall. I'm the director of the OU Arts and Humanities Forum. Yes. As you talk through the different centers and pillars of our research plan uh, moving forward, could you, uh, and as you stand on the stage at the Fred Jones, could you, could you articulate from your perspective how you see arts and humanities disciplines fitting into the research profile of the institution? Yeah, um, I think what, by the way, I think what the, the Humanities Forum is doing it's terrific, congratulations on you know, new grants uh, through foundations and things like that and the work uh, uh, that you're doing with uh, uh, some of the institutes uh, that was to that. I, I th I've always um, talked about convergence and I've always talked about the importance of bringing together the humanities, the social sciences, the fine arts in convergence across academic boundaries with the STEM disciplines to tackle grand challenges. And that's where I see this. I see in anything that we do, I want to continue incentivizing the idea that it takes all disciplines to tackle a really difficult grand challenge and to have impact on society. And, and that's how I see it. That's how I've seen it from the very beginning and that's how I see it going forward. Uh, David, I mean, you have been working closely with some of the faculty in, in the humanities, in digital humanities, you, you know, you, you have some very good active examples of those kinds of collaborations. Um, you know, I think we have to continue incentivizing the concept of transdisciplinary convergence, 
Because that, to me, at the end of the day, you know, which stands at the top of our strategic plan from the very beginning, right? That, to me, at the very end, is what drives impact on society. So that's what I want to see more. I want to see more collaboration across disciplines. Um, some of you have heard me say this before. I said it uh, often early when I came to the university. Uh, a multidisciplinary team of a mechanical engineering engineer, a chemical engineer, and an aeronautical engineer is not a convergent team. It's a group of engineers. Okay? Uh, so, so nothing wrong with three engineers working together, okay? But uh, what we're looking for is, is, is really much broader than that. And I think through ICAST and through the Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, uh, through DISC and through all the other centers and institutes as we move forward, we're going to see and, and incentivize and look for more and more of that collaboration across disciplines. Yeah, John. Jim, uh, you may not be aware of this. Just a quick example. Tomas was mentioning David had some examples. Uh, this past couple of years, I ran the Strategic Equipment uh, in, uh, Innovation Program uh, investment program, I should say. And we're real excited the committee was received several applications from the Fine Arts College. And we're so pleased to award one to Seth Gordon, actually, for the project called the Green Hippo 3D Projection Mapper. That technology is so cool, and I think it's going to really have a huge impact on the fine arts. And we can't wait to see it uh, come to fruition. So that's just one example. You're right, though, that we do need to pay more attention and be more intentional about integrating uh, the fine arts into the research program. I think it's so important. It was fascinating, actually, when we had the RFP for the equipment program that John is talking about. Um, um, the College of Fine Arts was, I think, was the largest responder uh, uh, to the RFP, and they really had this fantastic ideas that were sort of, you know, technology that's going to help theater, technology that's going to help music program. And so we're very, uh, uh, it was very satisfying to see that. I talked with Mary Margaret. And, uh, you know, we talk about what was, what was most important and supported some of that work, and we plan to continue doing that going forward in the future. So, yeah, thanks for that, John. Anything else? All right, look, uh, thank you all so much uh, for participating, both on Zoom and here in person. I uh, really appreciate all the amazing work that you're all doing, the huge support for the research and creative activity mission of the university. Uh, we're on a great trajectory. Let's keep it going. Thank you.